Guy Carpons in the game Chapter 3 The Men Who Caused the French Revolution 1789 in the previous chapter. Chapter evidence was given to prove how a small group of foreign money lenders, operating through their English agents, remained anonymous while they secured control of that nation's economy for the modest sum of £1,250,000. Evidence will now be produced to identify some of these international Jewish money lenders and prove they, or their successors, plotted and planned, and helped finance, the Great French Revolution of 1789, exactly the same way as they had plotted and planned and financed the English Revolution of 1640 to 1649. In succeeding chapters evidence will be produced to prove that the descendants of these same international Jewish financiers have been the secret power behind every war and revolution from 1789 onwards. The Jewish Encyclopedia says Edom is in modern Jewry. This is a very important admission, because the word Edom means red. History reveals that a Jewish goldsmith, Amschel Moses Bauer, tired of his wandering in Eastern Europe, decided in 1750 to settle down in Frankfurt on the Main in Germany. He opened a shop, or counting house, in the Jundenstrasse district. Over the door of his shop he placed as his sign of business a red shield. It is of the greatest importance to remember that the Jews in Eastern Europe, who belonged to the revolutionary movement based on terrorism, had also adopted the red flag as their emblem because it represented blood. Amschel Moses Bauer had a son born in 1743 and he named him Amschel Meyer Bauer. The father died in 1754 when his son was only 11 years of age. The boy had shown great ability, and extraordinary intelligence, and his father had taught him everything possible about the rudimentary principles of the money lending business. It had been the father's intention to have his son trained as a rabbi but death intervened. A few years after his father's death Amschel Meyer Bauer was employed by the Oppenheimer Bank as a clerk. He soon proved his natural ability for the banking business and was rewarded with a junior partnership. Later he returned to Frankfurt where he secured control and ownership of the business which had been established by his father in 1750. The red shield was still proudly displayed over the door. Knowing the secret significance of the Red Shield Amschel Meyer Bauer decided to adopt it as the new family name. Red Shield in German is Rothschild and thus the House of Rothschild came into being. Amschel Meyer Bauer lived until 1812. He had five sons. All of them were specially trained to become captains of high finance. Nathan, one of the sons, showed exceptional ability and, at the age of 21, went to England with the definite purpose of securing control of the Bank of England. The purpose was to use this control to work in conjunction with his father and other brothers to set up, and consolidate, an international banking monopoly in Europe. The combined wealth of the international banking pool could then be used to further the secret ambitions his father had made known to all his sons. To prove his ability, Nathan Rothschild turned £20,000, with which he had been entrusted, into £60,000 in three years. In studying the world revolutionary movement it is important to remember that the red flag was the symbol of the French Revolution and every revolution since. More significant still is the fact that when Lenin, financed by international bankers, overthrew the Russian government and established the first totalitarian dictatorship in 1917, the design of the flag was a red flag, with a hammer and sickle, and the star of Judea imposed. In 1773, when Meyer Rothschild was only 30 years of age, he invited 12 other wealthy and influential men to meet him in Frankfurt. His purpose was to convince them that if they agreed to pool their resources they could then finance and control the world revolutionary movement and use it as their manual of action to win ultimate control of the wealth, natural resources, and manpower of the entire world. Rothschild revealed how the English Revolution had been organized. He pointed out the mistakes and errors that had been made. The revolutionary period had been too long. The elimination of reactionaries had not been accomplished with sufficient speed and ruthlessness. The planned reign of terror, by which the subjugation of the masses was to be accomplished speedily, had not been put into effective operation. Even after all these mistakes had been made the initial purpose of the revolution had been achieved. The bankers who instigated the revolution had established control of the national economy and consolidated the national debt. 
By means of intrigue carried out on an international scale they had increased the national debt steadily by loaning the money to fight the wars and rebellions they had fomented since 1694. Basing his arguments on logic and sound reasoning, Meyer Rothschild pointed out that the financial results obtained as the result of the English Revolution would be as nothing when compared to the financial rewards to be obtained by a French Revolution provided those present agreed to unity of purpose and put into effect his carefully thought out and revised revolutionary plan. The project would be backed by all the power that could be purchased with their pooled resources. This agreement reached, Meyer Rothschild unfolded his revolutionary plan. By clever manipulation of their combined wealth it would be possible to create such adverse economic conditions that the masses would be reduced to a state bordering on starvation by unemployment. By use of cleverly conceived propaganda it would be easy to place the blame for the adverse economic conditions on the king, his court, the nobles, the church, industrialists, and the employers of labor. Their paid propagandists would arouse feelings of hatred and revenge against the ruling classes by exposing all real and alleged cases of extravagance, licentious conduct, injustice, oppression, and persecution. They, would also invent infamies to bring into disrepute others who might, if left alone, interfere with their overall plans. One after the general introduction to build up an enthusiastic reception for the plot he was about to unfold. Rothschild turned to a manuscript and proceeded to read a carefully prepared plan of action. The following is what I have been assured is a condensed version of the plot by which the conspirators hoped to obtain ultimate undisputed control of the wealth, natural resources, and manpower of the entire world. One the speaker started to unfold the plot by saying that because the majority of men were inclined to evil rather than to good the best results in governing them could be obtained by using violence and terrorism and not by academic discussions. The speaker reasoned that in the beginning human society had been subject to brutal and blind force which was afterwards changed to law. He argued that law was force only in disguise. He reasoned it was logical to conclude that by the laws of nature right lies in force. Too, he next asserted that political freedom is an idea and not a fact. He stated that in order to usurp political power all that was necessary was to preach liberalism so that the electorate, for the sake of an idea, would yield some of their power and prerogatives which the plotters could then gather together into their own hands. 3. The speaker asserted that the power of gold had usurped the power of liberal rulers even then, i.e. 1773. He reminded his audience that there had been a time when faith had ruled but stated that once freedom had been substituted for faith the people did not know how to use it. In moderation, he argued that because of this fact it was logical to assume that they could use the idea of freedom to bring about class wars. He pointed out that it was immaterial to the success of his plan whether the established governments were destroyed by internal or external foes because the victor had of necessity to seek the aid of capital which is entirely in our hands £21 for. He argued that the use of any and all means to reach their final goal was justified on the grounds that the ruler who governed by the moral code was not a skilled politician because he left himself vulnerable and in an unstable position on his throne. He said those who wish to rule must have recourse to cunning and to make believe because great national qualities like frankness and honesty, our vices in politics are 31-5. He asserted our right lies in force. The word right is an abstract thought and proves nothing. I find a new right, to attack by the right of the strong, and to scatter to the winds all existing forces of order and regulation, to reconstruct all existing institutions, and to become the sovereign lord of all those who left to us the rights to their powers by laying them down voluntarily in their liberalism. 6. He then admonished his listeners with these words The power of our resources must remain invisible until the very moment when it has gained such strength that no cunning or force can undermine it. He warned them that any deviation from the line of the strategical plan he was making known to them would risk bringing to naught the labours of centuries. 7. He next advocated the use of mob psychology to obtain control of the masses. He reasoned that the might of the mob is blind, senseless, and unreasoning and ever at the mercy of suggestion from any side. He stated only a despotic ruler can rule the mob efficiently because without absolute despotism there can be no existence for civilization which was carried out not by the masses, but by their guide 
whosoever that person might be. He warned the moment the mob seizes freedom in its hands it quickly turns to anarchy. 8. He next advocated that the use of alcoholic liquors, drugs, moral corruption, and all forms of vice, be used systematically by their agenters 4L to corrupt the morals of the youth of the nations. He recommended that the special agenters should be trained as tutors, lackeys, governesses, clerks and by our women in the places of dissipation frequented by the Goyim 5i he added in the number of these last I count also the so-called society ladies who become voluntary followers of the others in corruption and luxury. We must not stop at bribery, deceit and treachery when they should serve towards the attainment of our end. 9 Turning to politics he claimed they had the right to seize property by any means, and without hesitation, if by doing so they secured submission, and sovereignty. He pronounced our state marching along the path of peaceful conquest has the right to replace the horrors of wars by less noticeable and more satisfactory sentences of death necessary to maintain the terror which tends to produce blind submission. 10. Dealing with the use of slogans he said in ancient times we were the first to put the words liberty, equality and fraternity into the mouths of the masses. Words repeated to this day by stupid poll parrots, words which the would-be wise men of the Goyim could make nothing of in their abstractness, and did not note the contradiction of their meaning and interrelation. He claimed the words brought under their directions and control legions who bore our banners with enthusiasm. He reasoned that there is no place in nature for equality, liberty or fraternity. He said on the ruins of the natural and genealogical aristocracy of the Goyim we have set up the aristocracy of money. The qualification for this aristocracy is wealth which is dependent upon us. Asterisk slash slash this would suppose that the speaker felt that hereditary aristocracy is a natural development, societal evolution, and is a blessing, and that the gift of statecraft is perpetually passed on from father to son. Was it really his opinion, or was it just visited upon him, after the fact, by the writer of these original documents who seems to be in favor of feudalism? 11. He next expounded his theories regarding war. In 1773 he set down a principle which the governments of Britain and the United States publicly announced as their joint policy in 1939. He said it should be the policy of those present to foment wars but to direct the peace conferences so that neither of the combatants obtained territorial gains. He said the wars should be directed so that the nations engaged on both sides would be placed further in their debt and in the power of our agenters. 12. He next dealt with administration. He told those present that they must use their wealth to have candidates chosen for public office who would be servile and obedient to our commands, so they may readily be used as pawns in our game by the learned and genius men we will appoint to operate behind the scenes of government as official advisers. He added the men we appoint as advisers will have been bred, reared, and trained from childhood in accordance with our ideas to rule the affairs of the whole world. 13. He dealt with propaganda, and explained how their combined wealth could control all outlets of public information while they remained in the shade and clear of blame regardless of what the repercussions might be due to the publication of libels, slanders, or untruths. The speaker said thanks to the press we have got gold in our hands notwithstanding the fact that we had to gather it out of the oceans of blood and tears. But it has paid us even though we have sacrificed many of our own people. Each victim on our side is worth a thousand Goyim P14. He next explained the necessity of having their agenter always come out into the open, and appear on the scene, when conditions had reached their lowest ebb, and the masses had been subjugated by means of want and terror. He pointed out that when it was time to restore order they should do it in such a way that the victims would believe they had been the prey of criminals and irresponsibles. He said by executing the criminals and lunatics after they have carried out our preconceived reign of terror, we can make ourselves appear as the saviors of the oppressed, and the champions of the workers. The speaker then added we are interested in just the opposite. In the diminution, the killing out of the Goyim P-15. He next explained how industrial depressions and financial panics could be brought about and used to serve their purpose saying enforced unemployment and hunger, imposed on the masses because of the power we have to create shortages of food, will create the right of capital to rule more surely than it was given to the real aristocracy, 
and by the legal authority of King's P he claimed that by having their agenter control the mob, the mob could then be used to wipe out all who dared to stand in their way. 16 The infiltration into Continental Freemasonry was next discussed extensively. The speaker stated that their purpose would be to take advantage of the facilities and secrecy Freemasonry had to offer. He pointed out that they could organize their own Grand Orient lodges within Blue Freemasonry in order to carry on their subversive activities and hide the true nature of their work under the cloak of philanthropy. He stated that all members initiated into their Grand Orient lodges should be used for proselytizing purposes and for spreading their atheistic materialistic ideology amongst the Goyim. He ended this phase of the discussion with the words. When the hour strikes for our Sovereign Lord of all the world to be crowned these same hands will sweep away everything that might stand in his way p asterisk slash slash are you saying that, anti-Catholic, anti-monarchical, anti-feudalist, anti-Christian, Freemasonry, continental or otherwise, was good until the international money power ruined it. 17 He next expounded the value of systematic deceptions pointing out that their agenter should be trained in the use of high-sounding phrases, and the use of popular slogans. They should make the masses the most lavish of promises. He observed the opposite of what has been promised can always be done afterwards. That is of no consequence p. He reasoned that by using such words as freedom and liberty, the goyim could be stirred up to such a pitch of patriotic fervour that they could be made to fight even against the laws of God, and nature. He added and for this reason after we obtain control the very name of God will be erased from the lexicon of life. 6118. He then detailed the plans for revolutionary war, the art of street fighting, and outlined the pattern for the reign of terror which he insisted must accompany every revolutionary effort. Because it is the most economical way to bring the population to speedy subjection. 19. Diplomacy was next discussed. After all wars secret diplomacy must be insisted upon in order that our agenter, masquerading as political, financial, and economic advisors, can carry out our mandates without fear of exposing who are the secret power behind national and international affairs. The speaker then told those present that by secret diplomacy they must obtain such control that the nations cannot come to even an inconsiderable private agreement without our secret agents having a hand in it. 20 ultimate world government the goal. To reach this goal the speaker told them it will be necessary to establish huge monopolies, reservoirs of such colossal riches, that even the largest fortunes of the goyim will depend on us to such an extent that they will go to the bottom together with the credit of their governments on the day after the great political smash. The speaker then added you gentlemen here present who are economists just strike an estimate of the significance of this combination. 21 Economic War Plans to rob the Goyim of their landed properties and industries were then discussed. A combination of high taxes, and unfair competition was advocated to bring about the economic ruin of the Goyim as far as their national financial interests and investments were concerned. In the international field he felt they could be encouraged to price themselves out of the markets. This could be achieved by the careful control of raw materials, organized agitation amongst the workers for shorter hours and higher pay and by subsidizing competitors. The speaker warned his co-conspirators that they must arrange matters, and control conditions, so that the increased wages obtained by the workers will not benefit them in any way. 22. Armaments. It was suggested that the building up of armaments for the purpose of making the Goyim destroy each other should be launched on such a colossal scale that in the final analysis there will only be the masses of the proletariat left in the world with a few millionaires devoted to our cause. And police, and soldiers sufficient to protect our interests. 23 The New Order. The members of the One World Government would be appointed by the dictator. He would pick men from amongst the scientists, the economists, the financiers, the industrialists, and from the millionaires because in substance everything will be settled by the question of figures. 24. Importance of Youth. The importance of capturing the interest of youth was emphasized with the admonition that our agenter s should infiltrate into all classes, and levels of society and government, for the purpose of fooling, bemissing, and corrupting the younger members of society by teaching them theories and principles we know to be false. 25 National and international laws should not be changed but should be used as they are, 
to destroy the civilization of the Goya merely by twisting them into a contradiction of the interpretation which first masks the law and afterwards hides it altogether. Our ultimate aim is to substitute arbitration for law. The speaker then told his listeners you may think the Goyim will rise upon us with arms, but in the West we have against this possibility an organization of such appalling terror that the very stoutest hearts quail, the underground, the metropolitans, the subterranean corridors, these will be established in the capitals and cities of all countries before that danger threatens the use of the word West has great significance. It makes it plain that Rothschild was addressing men who had joined the world revolutionary movement which was started in the Pale of Settlement in the East. It must be remembered that before Amschel Moses Bauer settled down in Frankfurt, Germany, he had followed his trade as a gold and silversmith, travelling extensively in the east of Europe, where he had undoubtedly met the men his son Amschel Meyer addressed after he developed from a money lender into a banker and established the House of Rothschild in the Jundenstrasse where the above meeting is said to have taken place in 1773. As far as can be ascertained the original plan of the conspiracy ended at the point where it terminated above. I am satisfied that the documents which fell into the hands of Professor S. Nillis in 1901, and which he published under the title The Jewish Peril in 1905 in Russia, were an enlargement of the original plot. There appears to be no change in the first section but various additions disclose how the conspirators had used Darwinism, Marxism and even Nisishism. More important still, the documents discovered in 1901 disclose how Zionism was to be used. It must be remembered that Zionism was only organized in 1897. This matter is referred to later, when the intrigue leading up to the abdication of King Edward VIII is explained. The translation Mr. Victor Marsden made of the Jewish peril, was published by the Britain's Publishing Society, London, England, under the title The Protocols of the Learned Elders of Zion in 1921. This book is also discussed. It appears logical to say that the discovery of the later document confirms the existence of the earlier one. Little, if anything is changed, but considerable material is added probably due to the rapid development of the international conspiracy. The only point upon which there seems to be grounds for disagreement is in regard to the titles chosen by Professor Nillis and Mr. Marsden for their books. Mr. Marsden definitely states the contents of his book are the protocols of the meetings of the learned elders of Zion whereas it would appear it was a plot presented to moneylenders, goldsmiths, industrialists, economists, and others, by Amschel Meyer Rothschild who had graduated from moneylender to banker. Once the spirit of revolt against constituted authority had been aroused within the hearts and minds of the masses, the actual revolutionary effort would be carried out under the impetus of a preconceived reign of terror. The reign of terror would be conceived by the leaders of the Jewish Illuminati. They in turn would have their agents infiltrate into the newly organized French Freemasonry and establish therein lodges of Grand Orient Masonry to be used as the revolutionary underground and as their instrument for proselytizing the doctrine of atheistic, dialectical and historical materialism. Rothschild ended his discourse by pointing out that if proper precautions were taken their connection with the revolutionary movement need never be known. The question may well be asked how can it be proved these secret meetings were held? And if they were held how is it possible to prove what matters were discussed at such meetings? The answer is simple. The devilish plot was made known by an act of God. In 1785 a courier was galloping madly on horseback from Frankfurt to Paris carrying detailed information regarding the world revolutionary movement in general, and instructions for the planned French Revolution in particular. The instructions originated with the Jewish Illuminati in Germany and were addressed to Grand Master of the Grand Orient Masons in France. The Grand Orient Lodges had been established as the revolutionary underground by the Du d'Orleans after he, as Grand Master of French Masonry, had been initiated into the Jewish Illuminati in Frankfurt by Mirabeau. The courier was struck by lightning while passing through Radisbon, and killed. The documents he carried fell into the hands of the police who turned them over to the Bavarian government. A record of historical events told in chronological order connects the House of Rothschild with the Jewish Illuminati in Frankfurt and the Illuminati within French Freemasonry known as the Grand Orient Lodges as will be shown. 
It has been recorded how the Jewish rabbis claimed the power to interpret the secret and hidden meanings of the writings of Holy Scripture by special revelation obtained through Kabbalah. Claiming to have such powers was of little avail unless they had an organization, or instrument, in their hands to put the inspiration they claimed to have received into effect. The moneylenders, certain high priests, directors and elders decided to organize a very secret society to serve their evil purpose they named it the Illuminati. The word Illuminati is derived from the word Lucifer, which means bearer of the light, or being of extraordinary brilliance. Therefore the Illuminati was organized to carry out the inspirations given to the high priests by Lucifer during the performance of their Kabbalistic rites. Thus Christ is proved justified when he named them of the synagogue of Satan. The Supreme Council of the Jewish Illuminati numbered 13. They were, and still remain, the executive body of the Council of 33. The heads of the Jewish Illuminati claim to possess superlative knowledge in everything pertaining to religious doctrine, religious rites, and religious ceremonies. They were the men who conceived the atheistic materialistic ideology which in 1848 was published as the Communist Manifesto by Karl Marx. Marx was the nephew of a Jewish rabbi but he disassociated himself officially from the Jewish high priesthood when designated to perform his important duties putting into practice once again the Joint Stock Co. Principle of Operation The reason the Supreme Council numbered 13 was to remind the members that their one and only duty was to destroy the religion founded by Christ and his twelve apostles. JTL to ensure secrecy and avoid the possibility of Judas-like betrayal, every man initiated into the Illuminati was required to take an oath of unlimited obedience to the head of the Council of 33 and to recognize no mortal as above him. In an organization, such as the Illuminati, this meant that every member acknowledged the head of the Council of 33 as his god upon this earth. This fact explains how high-level communists, even today, swear on oath that they do not give allegiance to Russia. They don't. They give allegiance only to the head of the directors of the World Revolutionary Movement. The Supreme Council decided they would use the Ingolds. Lodge to organize a campaign by which the agents or cells of the Illuminati would infiltrate into continental Freemasonry and, under the cloak of social enjoyment and public philanthropy, organize their revolutionary underground. Those who infiltrated into continental Freemasonry were ordered to establish lodges of the Grand Orient and use them for proselytism so they could quickly contact non Jews of wealth, position, and influence connected with both church and state. Then, by using the age-old methods of bribery, corruption, and graft, they could make them become willing, or unwilling, disciples of Illuminism. They could make them preach the inversion of the Ten Commandments of God. They could make them advocate atheistic materialism. Once this policy had been decided upon, agents of the Supreme Council contacted the Marquis of Mirabeau as the most likely person in France to serve their ends. Phi belonged to the nobility. He had great influence in court circles, he was an intimate friend of the Du d'Orleans whom they had decided they would use as front man to lead the French Revolution. But more important still, the Marquis of Mirabeau was devoid of morals and his licentious excesses had led him heavily into debt. It was a simple matter for the moneylenders to have their agents contact Mirabeau, the famous French orator. Under the guise of friends and admirers they offered to help him out of his financial difficulties. What they actually did was lead him down the primrose path into the very depths of vice and debauchery until he was so deeply in their debt that he was forced to do their bidding. At a meeting to consolidate his debts, Mirabeau was introduced to Moses Mendelssohn, one of the big Jewish financiers who took him in hand. Mendelssohn in due time introduced Mirabeau to a woman, famous for her personal beauty and charm but without moral scruples. This stunning Jewess was married to a man named Hearse, but, to a man like Mirabeau, the fact that she was married only made her more desirable. It wasn't long before she was spending more time with Mirabeau than she was spending with her husband. Heavily in debt to Mendelssohn, tightly ensnared by MRS. Hers, Mirabeau was completely helpless. He had swallowed their bait hook, line, and sinker. But, like good fishermen, they played him gently for a time. If they exerted too great a pressure the leader might break and their fish might get away. Their next move was to have him initiated into Illuminism. He was sworn to secrecy and unlimited obedience under pain of death. 
the next move was to lead him into compromising situations which mysteriously became public. This method of destroying a man's character became known as the practice of el infamy. Because of scandals and organized detraction, Mirabeau was ostracized by many of his social equals. His resentment produced a desire for revenge and thus he embraced the revolutionary cause. Mirabeau's task was to induce the Duc d'Orleans to lead the revolutionary movement in France. It was implied that once the king had been forced to abdicate he would become the democratic ruler of France. The real plotters of the French Revolution were careful not to let either Mirabeau or the Duc d'Orleans know they intended to murder the king and queen, and thousands of the nobility. They made Mirabeau and the Duc d'Orleans believe that the purpose of the revolution was to free politics and religion from superstition and despotism. Another factor which made the men who were the secret power behind the revolutionary movement decide that the Duc d'Orleans should be their front man was the fact that he was Grand Master of French Freemasonry. Adam Weishaupt was given the task of adapting the ritual and rites of Illuminism for use of initiation into the Grand Orient Masonry. He also lived in Frankfurt, Germany. Mirabeau introduced the Duc d'Orleans and his friend Talleyrand to Weishaupt who initiated them into the secrets of Grand Orient Masonry. By the end of 1773 Philip, Duc d'Orleans had introduced the Grand Orient ritual into French Freemasonry. By 1788 there were more than 2,000 lodges in France affiliated with Grand Orient Masonry and the number of individual adepts exceeded 100,000. Thus the Jewish Illuminati under Moses Mendelssohn was introduced into continental Freemasonry by Weishaupt under the guise of lodges of the Grand Orient. The Jewish Illuminati next organized secret revolutionary committees within the lodges. Thus the revolutionary underground directors were established throughout France. Once Mirabeau had succeeded in having the Du d'Orleans amalgamate the Blue or National Freemasonry in France with the Grand Orient rites, he led his friend down the same primrose path which had led to his own social ostracism. In exactly four years, the Du d'Orleans was so heavily in debt that he was persuaded to engage in every form of illegal traffic and trade to recuperate his losses. But in some mysterious manner his ventures always seemed to go wrong and he lost more and more money. By 1780 he owed 800,000 livres. Once again the money lenders came forward and offered him advice in regard to his business transactions and financial aid. They very nicely maneuvered him into the position of signing over to them as security for their loans, his palace, his estates, his house, and the Palais Royal. The Du d'Orleans signed an agreement under which his Jewish financiers were authorized to manage his properties and estates so as to ensure him sufficient income to meet his financial obligations and leave him a steady and adequate income. The Du d'Orleans had never been too bright in regard to financial matters. To him the agreement he signed with his Jewish bankers appeared to be a sound financial deal. They had offered to manage his business affairs and turn them from a dismal failure into a great financial success. What more could he want? It is doubtful if the Du d'Orleans even suspected that there was a nigger hidden deep in the woodpile. It is doubtful if he even suspected he had sold himself body and soul to the agents of the devil but he had done so. He was completely in their hands. 8. The secret powers directing the French Revolution appointed Coderlos de Laclos to manage the Palais Royal and the Du d'Orleans estates. De Laclos is thought to have been a Jew of Spanish origin. When he was appointed manager of the Palais Royal he was acclaimed as the author of Les Liaisons Dangerouses and other pornographic works. He publicly defended his extreme immorality on the grounds that he studied the politics of love in all its varied aspects because of his love of politics. It matters little who Coderlos de Laclos was, it is what he did that is of importance. He turned the Palais Royal into the greatest and most notorious house of ill fame the world has ever known. In the Palais Royal he established every kind of lewd entertainment, licentious conduct, shameless shows, obscene picture galleries, pornographic libraries, and staged public exhibitions of the most bestial forms of sexual depravity. Special opportunities were provided for men and women who wished to indulge in every form of debauchery. The Palais Royal became the center in which details of the campaign for the systematic destruction of the French religious faith and public morals were conceived and carried out. This was done on the Kabbalistic theory that the best revolutionary is a youth devoid of morals. 
associated with de la Close was a Jew from Palermo named Cagliastro, alias Joseph Balsamo. He turned one of the Dew's properties into a printing house from which he issued revolutionary pamphlets. Balsamo organized a staff of revolutionary propagandists. In addition to literature they organized concerts, and plays, and debates calculated to appeal to the very lowest instincts of human nature and further the revolutionary cause. Balsamo also organized the spirings which enabled the men who were the secret power behind the revolutionary movement to put into operation their plan of El Tunfami to be used for systematic character assassination. Men and women, who were enticed into the web spun by de la Close and Balsamo, could be blackmailed into doing their bidding. Thus it was the Du de Orleans estates were turned into the center of revolutionary politics while, under the guise of lecture halls, theaters, art galleries and athletic clubs, the gambling rooms, brothels and wine and drug shops did a roaring trade. In this revolutionary underworld potential leaders were first ensnared. Their consciences were at first deadened by evil associations and then killed by indulgence in evil practices. The estates of the Du de Orleans were turned into factories in which the secret power behind the world revolutionary movement manufactured the pieces they intended to use in their game of international chess. Scudder, who wrote Prince of the Blood says of the Palais Royal, it gave the police more to do than all other parts of the city. But as far as the public was concerned, this infamous place was owned by the Du de Orleans, the cousin of the king. Only a mere handful of men and women knew that the moneylenders controlled it and used it to create a revolutionary organization which was to be the instrument of their revenge. And their manual of action to further their secret aims and ambitions. After the secret documents found on the body of the courier had been read by the police, the documents were passed on to the Bavarian government. The Bavarian government ordered the police to raid the headquarters of the Illuminati. Further evidence was obtained which exposed the widespread ramifications of the world revolutionary movement. The governments of France, England, Poland, Germany, Austria and Russia were informed of the international nature of the revolutionary plot, but as has happened repeatedly since, the governments concerned took no serious action to stop the diabolical conspiracy. Why? The only answer to this question is this, the power of the men behind the world revolutionary movement is greater than the power of any elected government. This fact will be proved time and time again as the story unfolds. The malevolent men who plot and plan the WRM have an another advantage over decent people. The average person, who believes in God and finds pleasure and enjoyment in the beautiful things with which God has blessed us, just cannot bring himself, or herself, to believe a diabolical plan of hatred and revenge could be conceived by human beings. Although all Christians believe most sincerely that the grace of God enters their own souls as the result of attending their religious services, receiving the sacraments, and saying their prayers, they cannot make themselves believe that through the ceremonies and rites of the Illuminati, be it the Semitic Kabbalah or the Aryan pagan Grand Orient type, the devil does inoculate his evil influence and powers into the hearts and souls of the men and women who accept, as their religion, Satanism, or atheism and put the theories of their high priests into practice. A few illustrations will be given to show how individuals and governments have remained just as stupid and naive in regard to warnings given them concerning the evil mechanism of the real leaders of the world revolutionary movement. After various governments failed to act on the information made known by the Bavarian police in 1785, the sister of Marie Antoinette wrote her personal letters warning her of the revolutionary plot the connection of the international bankers, the part Freemasonry was destined to play, and her own danger. Marie Antoinette, 1755-1793, was the daughter of the Emperor Francis I of Austria. She married Louis XVI of France. She just couldn't bring herself to believe the terrible things her own sister told her were being plotted by the Illuminati. To the repeated warnings sent by her sister, Marie Antoinette wrote long letters in reply. In regard to her sister's claim that evidence had been obtained that the Illuminati operating under the guise of philanthropic Freemasonry planned to destroy both the church and state in France, Marie Antoinette replied, I believe that as far as France is concerned, you worry too much about Freemasonry. Here it is far from having the significance it may have elsewhere in Europe.
How wrong she proved to be is a matter of history. Because she refused consistently to heed her sister's repeated warnings she and her husband died under the guillotine. Between 1917 and 1919 the British government was given full particulars regarding the international bankers who were at that time the secret power behind the WRM. The information was submitted officially by British intelligence officers, American intelligence officers and confirmed by Mr. Edendike and Sir M. Findlay. Mr. Edendike was the representative of the Netherlands government in St. Petersburg, now Leningrad, at the time. He looked after Britain's interests after the mob had wrecked the British embassy, and killed Commander E. N. Cromie. This aspect of the WRM is dealt with in detail in subsequent chapters on Russia. The majority of students of history believe Marie Antoinette was a woman who entered fully into the spirit and gaiety of the French court. It is generally accepted as a fact that she engaged in many affairs d'amour with her husband's close friends, and indulged in reckless extravagances. That is the picture Balsamo and his propagandists painted of her. The fact that they made their linf, Amy Stick enabled them to have the mob demand her life. But their version of the conduct of Marie Antoinette is a pack of lies, as historians have proved. The fortitude with which she bore the sufferings inflicted upon her by her enemies, the dignity with which she met her fate, and the resignation and courage with which she offered up her life on the scaffold, cannot be reconciled with the characteristics of a wanton woman. In order to defame Marie Antoinette, Weishaupt and Mendelssohn thought up the idea of the diamond necklace. At the time, the financial resources of France were at their lowest ebb and the government of France was begging the international money barons to grant them further credit. A secret agent of the arch-conspirators ordered a fabulous diamond necklace to be made by the court jewelers. The order for this necklace, the estimated value of which was a quarter of a million livres, was placed in the name of the queen. When the court jewelers brought the diamond necklace to the queen for her acceptance she refused to have anything to do with it. She disclaimed all knowledge of the transaction. But the news of the fabulous necklace leaked out as the plotters intended it should. Balsamo put his propaganda machine into operation. Marie Antoinette was deluged with criticism, her character was smeared, her reputation dragged in the mire by a whispering campaign of character assassination. And, as usual, nobody could ever put a finger on the person or persons who started the slanders. After this build-up, Balsamo uncorked his own special masterpiece. His printing presses turned out thousands upon thousands of pamphlets which claimed a secret lover of the Queen's had sent the necklace as a mark of appreciation for her favours. But those who operated El Infamy thought up even more diabolical slanders to circulate regarding the Queen. They wrote a letter to Cardinal Prince de Rohan to which they forged the signature of the Queen. In the letter he was asked to meet her at the Palais Royal about midnight to discuss the matter of the diamond necklace. A prostitute from the Palais Royal was engaged to disguise herself as the Queen, and involve the Cardinal. The incident was played up in newspapers and pamphlets and the foulest innuendos were circulated involving two of the highest personages of both church and state. History records that after the diamond necklace had served its foul purpose it was taken over to England and taken apart. A Jew named Eliason is said to have retained the majority of the valuable diamonds used in its original composition. Another piece of evidence which connects the English Jewish moneylenders with the plot to bring about the French Revolution was unearthed by Lady Queensborough, author of Occult Theocracy. While doing some research work she read a copy of El Antisemitism written by a Jew named Bernard Lazare and published in 1849. With the leads obtained from this book Lady Queensborough claims Benjamin Goldsmith, his brother Abraham, and their partner Moses Mekata, and his nephew Sir Moses Montefiore, were Jewish financiers in England who were definitely affiliated with their continental Jewish brethren in the plot to bring about the revolution in France. Further evidence was found to tie Daniel Itzig of Berlin, and his son-in-law David Friedlander, and her scared beer of Alsace in with the Rothschilds and the plot. Thus, are re revealed the men who at that time constituted the secret power behind the world revolutionary movement. Knowledge of the methods these men used to manoeuvre the French government into financial difficulty is of importance, because it set the pattern they followed in America, Russia, Spain and other countries afterwards. 
Sir Walter Scott in Volume 2 of The Life of Napoleon, gives a clear story of the initial moves. He then sums up the situation with these words These financiers used the government, French, as bankrupt prodigals are treated by usurious money lenders who, feeding the extravagance with one hand, with the other wring out of their ruined fortunes the most. Unreasonable recompenses for their advances. By a long succession of these ruinous loans, and various rights granted to guarantee them, the whole finances of France were brought to a total confusion. 9. After the government of France was forced into the position of seeking huge loans because of debts incurred in fighting wars to further the secret ambitions of the international conspirators, they very kindly offered to supply the money providing they could write the terms of the agreement. On the surface their terms were most lenient. But again they had placed a nigger in the woodpile in the person of one M. Necker. He was to be appointed to the French King's Council as his chief minister of financial affairs. The Jewish financiers pointed out that this financial wizard would pull France out of her monetary troubles in less than no time at all. What he actually did during the next four years was to involve the French government so badly with the Jewish financiers that the national debt increased to £170 million. Captain A. H. M. Ramsey sums up the situation aptly in The Nameless War. He says, revolution is a blow struck at a paralytic. When the debt grip has been firmly established, Control of every form of publicity and political activity soon follows, together with a full grip on industrialists, both management and labor. The stage is then set for the revolutionary blow. The grip of the right hand of finance establishes the paralysis, while the revolutionary left hand that holds the dagger and deals the fatal blow. Moral corruption facilitates the whole process. While Balsamo's propaganda sheets damned the higher officials of both church and state, Special agents of the Illuminati organized the men who were to be used as leaders in the Reign of Terror planned to accompany the revolutionary effort. Among these leaders were Robespierre, Danton, and Marat. To conceal their real purpose, the men who were to release the prisoners and lunatics to create the necessary atmosphere for instituting the preconceived Reign of Terror, met in the Jacobean convent. Within the walls of the sacred edifice the details of the bloody plan were worked out. The lists of reactionaries marked down for liquidation were compiled. It was explained that while the criminals and lunatics ran wild terrorizing the population by committing mass murders and publicly performing rapes, the organized underground workers, under direction of Manuel, procurer of the commune, would round up all the important political figures, heads of the clergy, and military officers known to be loyal to the king. R101 The men who were to emerge from the Jewish organized underground were formed into Jacobin clubs. Under leaders, who were well versed in the duties required of them to direct the reign of terror, they conducted the mass atrocities so they would serve the purpose of their hidden masters, and move them further towards their ultimate goal. 1 These were the original theories on which class war was ultimately organized. To this statement in the original documents should convince all but the biased that the speaker was not a rabbi or elder of the Jews nor was he addressing elders and rabbis because it was the goldsmiths, the money lenders, and their affiliates in commerce and industry who in 1773 had the wealth of the world in their hands as they have it still in their hands in the 20th century. 3. The Red Fog explains how this theory has been put into effect in America since 1900. For the word agenter means the complete organized body of agents, spies, counter spies, blackmailers, saboteurs, underworld characters, and everything and every body outside the law which enables the international conspirators to further their secret plans and ambitions. 5. The word goyim means all others than their own group. The unimportant people. 6. The lexicon of life he referred to, was Almighty God's plan of creation. 7. There were also 13 tribes of Israel which could have some bearing on the matter of numbers. 8. The same evil geniuses used their agents to involve William Pitt in debt and forced him to resign as Prime Minister of England because during the early part of his ministry he obstinately refused to allow England to become involved in wars. They planned to further their own secret plans and ambitions. Pitt had learned a great deal regarding the part the international money barons played in international affairs when Chancellor of the Exchequer 1785.
9 Because of his alleged anti-Semitic utterances Sir Walter Scott's important works consisting of a total of nine volumes dealing with many phases of the French Revolution have been given the silent treatment by those who control the publishing houses as well as the biggest portion of the press. They are almost unattainable except in museum libraries and are never listed with his other works. Asterisk slash slash it was attainable in 1958, and today it is online. Several editions of it were published, and in the first half of the 19th century a generation of Americans learned the history of the Revolution and Napoleon from it. John S. C. Abbott on Scott's Flistery, bowed down with adversity and overwhelmed with debt, to extricate himself he performed the Herculean task of writing the life of Napoleon in one year. He had no time for investigation. Writing with the utmost rapidity, he could only record, in those glowing words which his genius ever dictated, the current rumors respecting Napoleon which were at his hand in the English journals. The success of his enterprise depended upon his writing a book adapted to the prejudices of the higher classes of English society. And he doubtless thought that the views cherished by the English aristocracy were correct. Himself a high Tory in political principles, and breathing the very atmosphere of hostility to all democratic tendencies, it would be demanding too much of frail human nature us expect, from his pen, an impartial delineation of the career of the great foe of aristocratic privilege. 10 Sir Walter Scott Life of Napoleon, Volume 2, P30 says the demand of the Communit de Paris, now the 